Somewhere, a true believer is training to kill you. He is training with minimal food or water, in austere conditions, training day and night. The only thing clean on him is his weapon, and he made his web gear. He doesn't worry about what workout to do. His ruck weighs what it weighs, his runs end when the enemy stops chasing him. This true believer is not concerned about how hard it is. He knows either he wins or dies. He doesn't go home at 1700. He is home. He knows only the cause. This quote has stayed with me since I first entered the military. I believe the quote should be attributed to one new de Fion Doc as the originator. The quote itself encapsulates the relentless drive of those who believe utterly in their cause, those who find their purpose not in comfort, but in the struggle itself. There's a bit of psychology behind this phenomenon, looking into the types of individuals most susceptible to becoming true believers, the core ideas driving mass movements, and the relevance of Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer, in our contemporary world. Hoffer's central thesis is that mass movements attract individuals who are discontented with their lives. But it's not just any discontent that fuels these movements, it's a profound dissatisfaction often rooted in a deep sense of frustration, failure, or alienation. These individuals seek something more, an identity, a purpose, and a community. For them, mass movements offer a new beginning, a chance to escape their personal struggles by subsuming their identity into a larger cause. The first group Hoffer identifies as vulnerable to mass movements are the discontented. These are people who feel that life has not given them their due, whether due to economic hardship, social marginalization, or personal failure. They're often frustrated, feeling like they're stuck in a situation they can't control. For them, mass movements provide an outlet for their dissatisfaction, offering a promise of change of a new order that will correct the injustices they perceive in their lives. For example, the rise of the working class movement in the early 20th century, leading to the formation of labor unions and socialist parties, was driven by the discontented. More recently, the supporters of populist movements, such as the Brexit campaign in the United Kingdom, were largely driven by feelings of economic and social disenfranchisement. These individuals felt left behind by globalization and economic policies, leading them to rally around a cause that promised to restore their lost status and voice. Then, there are the poor. Economic deprivation is a powerful motivator. When people are struggling to meet their basic needs, they are naturally drawn to movements that promise them relief or redemption. In such circumstances, even the most extreme ideologies can seem attractive if they offer a way out of poverty. The poor often look to mass movements as a means of leveling the playing field, of gaining what they feel has been denied them. A historical example of this role of the impoverished masses is the Russian Revolution of 1917. The Bolshevik movement appealed to the poor by promising land, bread, and peace. Simple yet powerful messages that resonated with those who had little to lose and everything to gain, offering them not only material benefits but also a sense of purpose and belonging. Hoffer also speaks of the plight of the misfits. These are individuals who, for one reason or another, do not fit into the social order. They might be displaced by rapid societal changes, unable to keep up with the shifting norms, or simply unable to find their place in a world that values conformity. Mass movements appeal to these misfits because they offer a sense of belonging, a community that accepts them where society does not. A vivid example of this is the rise of online radicalization among young, disillusioned individuals. In the modern era, the internet has provided a platform for misfits to connect and form communities that reject mainstream culture. 
various extremist groups have gained traction by offering these individuals a sense of identity and purpose, often leading them down dangerous paths of violence. The new poor also represent another key demographic. These are people who were once comfortable, perhaps even prosperous, but have since fallen into poverty. This descent often comes with a sense of loss, humiliation, and a burning desire to regain what they've lost. Hoffer argues that the new poor are particularly susceptible to mass movements because these movements offer them a chance to reclaim their dignity and fight back against the forces that they believe are responsible for their decline. The 2008 financial crisis created a wave of new poor in the United States and Europe. People who lost their homes, jobs, and savings almost overnight. The new poor felt betrayed by the system and sought to restore their former security by rallying around a movement that promised to fix what had gone wrong. And it's not just limited to the Tea Party. Dozens of black-clad marchers began attacking a supermarket. Others urged them to stop, finally linking arms to protect the store from further destruction. Whether they wanted a restoration of how they perceived the old way to be properly run, or a complete destruction of the current way of doing business. What it boiled down to was groups on both ends of the spectrum saying how things would be different if it would be run their own way. Surprisingly, Hoffer also identifies the board as potential recruits for mass movements. In many places in Western society, this seems to be where the bulk of the recruits come from. These individuals, often materially comfortable but spiritually or emotionally unfulfilled, seek out movements to fill the void in their lives. The excitement, the thrill of participating in something greater than oneself, can be a powerful draw. For the board, mass movements offer a sense of purpose, an adventure, and a way to escape the tedium of everyday life. In the 21st century, we've seen a rise in middle-class individuals joining new social and political movements, not out of economic necessity, but out of a sense of boredom or the desire for meaning. The Occupy Wall Street movement attracted many who were materially comfortable but disillusioned with the status quo and seeking a cause to give their lives direction. The rise of social media activism has provided an outlet for those who feel disconnected from the traditional forms of community and engagement, allowing them to participate in global movements from the comfort of their own homes. Insecurity is another potent motivator. Hoffer's insecure are those who feel uncertain about their identity, role, or future. They are drawn to the certainty offered by mass movements, the black and white worldview, the clear distinctions between good and evil, right and wrong. By joining a movement, the insecure find a stable foundation upon which to build their identity, alleviating their doubts and fears with the movement's uncompromising ideology. The rise of religious fundamentalism often attracts individuals who are seeking clear, uncompromising answers to their existential questions. These movements provide a rigid structure that appeals to those who struggle with the uncertainties and complexities of modern life. The security offered by these movements can be intoxicating, turning insecurity into zealotry. Then there are the ambitious, people with dreams and aspirations, but no clear path to achieve them. When traditional avenues for success are blocked, whether by social structure, personal circumstances, or systemic barriers, mass movements offer an alternate route. Within these movements, the ambitious can find opportunities to rise, to lead, and to gain the recognition and power they crave. For them, the movement becomes a vehicle for personal achievement. History is replete with examples of ambitious individuals who rose to prominence through mass movements. Figures like Lenin and Mao also found their path to power through revolutionary movements that offered them a platform to channel their ambitions. 
In contemporary times, leaders on the left, such as Bernie Sanders in the United States and Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom, have tapped into the frustrations of the disillusioned and economically marginalized, channeling those feelings into powerful political movements. Sanders' campaign in 2016 and 2020, for example, galvanized millions with promises of universal health care, free college education, and the breaking up of large financial institutions. His message resonated strongly with those who felt disenfranchised by the existing political system and who were looking for a leader to articulate their frustrations and provide a clear path forward. Similarly, Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party was marked by a significant shift to the left, advocating for policies like the renationalization of key industries, the abolition of tuition fees, and increased taxes on the wealthy. These leaders tapped into the ambitions of a generation that saw little opportunity in the current system, offering them a vision of a more equitable society. For many of their supporters, these movements were not just about specific policies, but about a broader sense of reclaiming power and agency in a world where they felt increasingly powerless. This alignment with the ambitious, as described by Hoffer, highlights how even those with aspirations can become true believers when a movement offers them a clear and promising route to success. Another important demographic Hoffer discusses are the minority. Whether ethnic, religious, or political, minorities who feel marginalized or persecuted are often drawn to mass movements that promise empowerment or the restoration of their rights. And it doesn't matter if they actually are marginalized or persecuted, as long as you can get people to feel that way. This is effectively how they become captured by the movement. The movement's cause often aligns with their experiences of discrimination or their claims to experiences of discrimination, making them passionate advocates and participants. In modern times, we see this dynamic in movements like Black Lives Matter. This movement initially galvanized a broad spectrum of society by putting forward long-standing accusations of racial inequality. However, as with many mass movements, BLM has also faced criticism and controversy, particularly regarding the actions of some of its leaders. In recent years, allegations of financial mismanagement and fraud within the BLM organization have cast a shadow over the movement. Reports have surfaced about the misuse of donations and the opulent lifestyles of some leaders, leading to accusations that they exploited the movement for personal gain. These controversies have sparked a debate about the integrity of the movement and have led to the disillusionment among many supporters. This situation reflects a darker aspect of mass movements that Hoffer touched upon, the potential for corruption, abuse, and the betrayal of a movement's original ideals by those who rise to power within it. When leaders prioritize personal gain over the cause, it can undermine the movement's credibility and alienate its base. For the true believers who join the movement out of a genuine desire for change, such betrayals can be devastating, leading to disillusionment and a loss of faith in the movement's potential to achieve its goals. In many cases, this also leads to outright rejection of the movement. This can also manifest in the formation of a group that now moves counter to the original movement they were once a part of. Hoffer's analysis in The True Believer paints a complex picture of the psychological forces that drive individuals to join mass movements. It's not a single factor, but a convergence of dissatisfaction, insecurity, ambition, and the search for meaning that propels people into these movements. The modern lack of community, the lack of self-worth, these dynamics are as relevant today as they were in Hoffer's time, if not more. From the resurgence of socialist ideas in Western republics to the spread of populism across Latin America all echo the patterns Hoffer described. The world has seen a resurgence of mass movements, driven by similar motivations as those Hoffer identified in 1951. In Latin America, leaders like Evo Morales in Bolivia and AMLO in Mexico have risen to power by mobilizing those who feel marginalized by the neoliberal economic order. 
These movements, while promising different outcomes than their right-wing counterparts, are built on the same foundation of addressing deep-seated grievances and offering a new vision for society. Figures like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the United States and Pablo Iglesias in Spain have similarly tapped into the frustrations of the disillusioned, particularly among younger generations who are seeking alternatives to the status quo. These leaders have channeled the energies of mass movements to push for systemic change, advocating for policies that challenge existing power structures and promote greater equality, in their words. These examples show that whether driven by fear, hope, anger, or ambition, mass movements remain a potent force in shaping our world. As Hoffer suggests, the psychological forces that drive people into these movements are universal, cutting across ideological lines and manifesting in various forms depending on the historical and social context. We're navigating a world increasingly shaped by mass movements and ideologies, and it's crucial to understand the forces that drive people to such extremes. Eric Hoffer's insights remind us that while the desire for change can be powerful, it's equally important to remain vigilant about where that change leads. In every case, there is potential for both greatness and betrayal. Let's strive to be not just believers, but thinkers, aware of the complexities and responsibilities that come with our convictions. The mind must be made as strong as the body. Until the next video, be good, stay safe, and have a good one.